Uh, Mr. Rector, Vice Rectors Thomas and Heron, Dr. Linda, had spite me that my Netherlands needs their Houthis, uh, except Hovel respect for the Skonheit van den Tal, that needs me a Hazeke and had Netherlands. I am a Francais, a Gaman Mauvais, j'étudie le Francais, un jour en Néerlandais, l'autre, cinq jours par semaine, mais les deux sont difficiles et donc je continue en anglais. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I truly am delighted to be here again, to be back in Leuven. Um, although my Dutch teacher insists it's Luffe. Don't push the N's and always pronounce the V's as F's. So I come here and say Luffe and you all say Leuven. Okay. Um, but I am delighted to be back um, for several reasons. Uh, first, I get to speak to all of you. Um, I often get to speak to today's leaders. I go to ministers offices all the time, I go to parliament too often. I speak at conferences, at meetings, at closed door sessions to today's leaders. In Belgium you always get to speak to yesterday's leaders. Uh, cocktail parties, operas, and I'm not even a hunter. If I hunted it would be endless. But to me there's nothing more important than speaking to tomorrow's leaders. And tomorrow's leaders are here, always here, at Caillou Levin, or Luffa. Uh, I'm also delighted because for me it's in part a homecoming. I'm delighted to return. As the Vice Rector uh, mentioned, we met for the first time uh, two years ago. Um, in November of 2009, shortly after my wife, my son and I had first arrived in Belgium. Uh, I told you then about President Obama who I'm lucky enough to both represent and to call a friend. I explained our joint goal of rebuilding the Belgian-American partnership. And I said I hope to see the day when Americans could once again proudly wear Boston Red Sox t-shirts or New York Yankees t-shirts in the Grand Place. When Americans could once again proudly carry their guidebooks face up rather than face down without fear of being scorned for belonging to a country that had walked out of the Kyoto climate talks, without fear of being scorned for belonging to a country that had mistreated detainees in Guantanamo, or had plunged into a war in Iraq in search of weapons of mass destruction that appear never to have actually existed. I noted that we were here this time to be better partners, to be better listeners, to be better learners, than we had been in the decade that preceded the Obama presidency or had preceded my arrival. I pledged to study both French and Flemish and to rebuild the partnership not just with the government but with the citizens by visiting every city and village, all 587 of them. And I've made the homecoming. It's two years later and as we shall discuss the Belgian-American relationship and the appearance of the Boston Red Sox and New York Yankees t-shirts in the Grand Place indeed are in a far different place today than they were two years ago. And I still study language daily from 9 to 10, French one morning and Flemish the next. And we visited 317 of those cities so far. Third, I am delighted to be here to be the inaugural lecture this year at the series of lessons for the 21st century. Because when you look around Belgium, when you look around the United States, lessons for the 21st century are everywhere. So with your permission, I'd like to cover, I'd like to address three core sets of lessons for the 21st century. First, we need to discuss the lessons about the mess that my generation has made of the planet in the latter part of the 20th century and in the first, most of the first decade of the 21st century, and thus the lesson that we're now dependent on you to save the planet. We're now dependent on you to get the 21st century right, to solve the problems that we're leaving for you every day. Second, I'd like to discuss the lessons about where Belgium and where America are as we stand here today. In my mind, two democracy glasses that are at least half full, not half empty. And therefore, what we can each be proud of, and of course, what we can do better. And third, lessons about the Belgian-American relationship. Where it started, the low points to which it fell, where we have risen to as we speak, 
but where we still stumble as recently as last week, and thus the opportunities and the challenges that still lie ahead for the long-established government here and or for the soon-to-be-formed new government here. And to me, the question is whether Belgium can and whether Belgium will help lead a European consensus, whether Belgium will help form that consensus to the solutions for today, even while politics still causes my country to pause, while politics still hinders the progress in the United States. For me, it's whether Belgium will help fill those glasses from half full to all the way full for both the United States and Belgium so that we're both more successful in a safer and more prosperous world. So let's begin with the most important lesson of the 21st century, the lesson that we're now dependent on you to get the 21st century right, to save the planet. I know it's a large task, but someone has to do it, and the people I'm looking at right now are as qualified as anyone to do it. How could that be? You see, for far too long, my generation has made a mess of things. We got it wrong in the latter part of the 20th century and most of the first decade of the 21st on a great deal of fronts. We've left our economies teetering, our security under constant threat, our environment choking, and our relations with others who are different from us far too tense and far too distrustful. We've rendered our political systems nearly dysfunctional to the point where they're clearly part of the problem instead of being the source of the solution. And we've allowed our media, once our truly great hope, to contribute mightily to the breakdown of our political systems. Now, it's not the first time we face such challenges. We faced them before, even in the recent past. And we've been bailed out once before. And indeed, it was young entrepreneurs, young leaders, who came to the rescue then. Following the Second World War and up to the end of the 1970s, America, Belgium, and much of the world had been largely dependent on industries and natural resources. Old industries and natural resources. Steel, coal, heavy manufacturing. But the industries based on consumption, based on using up and not worrying about the future, like coal, steel, heavy manufacturing, they all slowly withered. And we hadn't invested in our future. Our formerly grand cities spent their time reminiscing about their formerly grand pasts. Just ask Newark, New Jersey, or Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, or Charlotte, or the Winter Swag Mine. And the economy seemed to have no place to go, and the workers may have been faced simply with going home. Now, who bailed us out the first time in the 1980s and the early 90s? Who put America back to work? Who saw the future when so many were still focusing on the past? Entrepreneurs, young business people, young leaders. It was people who looked just like you. Go back and look at the pictures and they'll look like your classmates. Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, may rest in peace, Michael Dell, People creating companies like Microsoft, AOL, Apple, Dell, Cisco. Now at the time, my generation thought Yahoo was something cowboys said when they chased horses. And Google was a noise that babies made when they finished their bottles. But that generation knew better. That generation of entrepreneurs and creators saw a little further down the road, and we thrived. But did it last? Did we learn a lesson? The lesson about the path to continued success. Not just about a bailout in the 80s and 90s, but about continued success. The lessons about sustainability, creativity, innovation, leadership by example and not by word, entrepreneurship. The lessons about giving back and not always taking out. Not much. The advances of the 1980s and 1990s indeed led to a faster-paced world, a world of fast money, big scores, loose regulation, and credit everywhere. 
So through most of the first decade of the new century, my generation stayed consistent, continued to make a mess of things, continued to leave our economy, our financial system, our security, and our environment close to disarray. Now I assure you, having lived there, it was all too easy to get there. All that it required was the pursuit of the cozy life, the path of least resistance. We needed to drive our cars and fuel our lifestyles. We needed to pay for our excesses. Pretty easy. Borrow heavily and create new financial instruments built on nothing more than the blindness of a financial industry who always be, believed that tomorrow would be bigger than today. We built houses of cards, usually made of credit cards. And in so doing, we failed to invest in new technologies, alternative energies that could actually fuel the next generation of real growth and real economic opportunities. While at the same time, we were contributing to the physical destruction of a planet ever more choking in carbon. And we failed to regulate our financial excesses. Now in the past few years, most politicians, most officials, most leaders have begun to get it. Some have stepped forward who actually see a little further down the road. Many have. You see in Belgium, in parts of Europe, and in the United States, certainly following the election of President Obama, leaders have well understood and acknowledged the mess and made real plans to remedy it. For where others see crisis, true leaders see opportunities. Inherent in the collapse of an economy, is the opportunity to rebuild it and to build it better the next time. To honor the past by transitioning to job creating industries of the future. Biotechnology, pharmaceuticals, agrobio foods, clean energy, information services, and more. And in marching into the future, we can leave no one behind. Inherent in a better world is a socially just world. And in these fields, in a world of technology, of alternative energy, of research and information, if you can build it in New York or Paris or Brussels or Mumbai, you can build it in Limburg or in Charleroi or in Newark or in Detroit. And for sure, we can only succeed at the pace of our slowest runner. So hope existed. Hope existed that this time, politicians and officials could lead us into getting it right. Maybe politicians can save our economies, fortify our national security, refocus our job growth, clean our environment, protect our citizens and our pocketbooks, and save our planet. But just as we hit our stride on the road to the better future, in both the US and in Belgium, politics is threatened to get into the way. Indeed, in the US, in Belgium, in many other countries, Government and politics have hit the tough times. The bigger the challenges that the countries faced, the more divided we became. The more divided we've become, the more difficult it has been to govern. And the media has at times contributed to the difficulty of governing. Aren't there lessons for the 21st century just about everywhere? Well, for Belgium and for the United States, and for their economies and for their politics, the recent past has been a couple of years full of lessons for the 21st century. Who could have thought that I could arrive this night in Leuven and explain that I live in a country called Belgium that has long had no government, but has always had a budget and has always been open, and I represent a country called the United States that's long had a government, but nearly had no budget and almost closed twice. On a larger but similar front, who would have thought that I could come tonight in Leuven at a time when Greece has nearly collapsed, Ireland faltered, Portugal faltered, Spain faltered, and Italy faltered, and the US dollar would still fall compared to the euro? Which brings us to our second set of lessons. Where Belgium and America each stand today as we speak. And to me, they are indeed democracy glasses that are half full, not half empty. You see, the parallels between Belgium and the United States this year have been extraordinary. 
Never before have two countries done so relatively well in such difficult times simply to impose extraordinary challenges on themselves through political chaos. And yet such political chaos in both countries is in large part a luxury that they've chosen to endure, at least in part, because they can afford to do so. And such political chaos is at its heart caused by the inefficiency of democracy. Whether the inefficiency of trying to put together a coalition from those with divided thoughts, or the inefficiency of trying to govern with a Senate and a House of Representatives controlled by opposing political parties. Yet it is this very inefficiency of democracy that I would submit is ultimately, and should ultimately always be, a source not of embarrassment for either the United States or Belgium, but a source of pride. Indeed, many throughout North America this, this year risked their lives or paid with their lives in the hope of one day attaining the inefficiency of democracy that Belgium and the United States so publicly have flouted these last two years. Now clearly both countries, Belgium and the United States, can and should do better. Leaders in both countries and every one of us in public life need to do better to avoid partisanship and stalemate. And citizens should demand that we do. Leaders can and should look to the greater good rather than to the political good that will make them look greater. But just as clearly, for all the pessimism that's reigned in both countries this year, for all the jokes and discussions of Guinness Books of Records, for all the attention given to rating agencies as if they were some divine determiner of prosperity, Belgium and the United States today remain two democracy glasses half full, not half empty. Let's start with a look at the United States. We have indeed come a long way in the past three years. And at a time when others of our allies, and perhaps even the forces of nature or the gods, have not made that road of recovery very easy. In early 2009, when the new Obama administration came to office, Americans were waking up every morning. First thing they were doing was checking the newspaper and the internet to see which bank might collapse that day so that they could more quickly transfer their checking accounts to a different bank before the collapse happened. And at that same time in early 2009, Europeans were waking up every day and furiously blaming America and filing lawsuits against American institutions for collapsing the European banking system as well. As of January 2009 in America, we were still headed down a long slope of losses of jobs from the economy, a rapidly contracting economy, and a nearly vertical rise in our unemployment. And the worst part was that no one knew for sure where the bottom might be, where the economic freefall would stop, or even if there would be a bottom at all. Indeed, by the time the new administration's policies could fully take effect by October of 2009, unemployment in the United States had risen 18 months in a row from April 2008 to October 2009 and had reached 10.1%. Two years later, the picture has indeed changed radically. The United States has gone from Americans checking newspapers for bank failures to reading about bank profits. That 10.1% unemployment in October 2009 had indeed been the high water point for unemployment, which has gradually fallen till it's down to 9.0 today. Indeed, having lost private sector jobs every month since long before that last presidential election, the US economy has now added private sector jobs every month for 18 months in a row. And what's most shocking, for many of these months, for the first time in over three decades, the US economy has added manufacturing jobs in the wake of the near collapse of the manufacturing sector that had occurred over several decades. 
We, the United States, are back to competing in sectors we had indeed long abandoned. And the car industry on life support at the start of the Obama administration is one of the, enemy, uh, is one of the engines of that economy. But there can be no question that the hole created by the financial crisis was deep and even expanding manufacturing, creating new jobs for 18 months in a row, leaves the U.S. with unacceptably high unemployment. So plainly we need to do more. But can more be done in the political climate that exists in the U.S. today? I do not know. The President laid out a jobs package. Can it pass both houses? Can progress be made? I do not know. I'm not here as a Democrat or as a Republican, but as an ambassador. So I blame neither side. But plainly, whether due to the constant media attention of 24-hour news cable like MSNBC and Fox News, politics has gotten to be somewhat closer to sport. And the results are, at a minimum, inefficient. It was therefore political intransience, not economic crisis, that led to my embassy coming within 24 hours of being closed and the United States government going on furlough. And we had our first debt ceiling crisis ever, costing the United States our AAA rating and sending the dollar plunging, while having relative economic prosperity but complete political dysfunction. So in the U.S., our economy has rallied. It has a ways to go, but politics may prevent it from getting there. And yet, on at least some level, having the freedom to debate politics at the cost of some efficiency and prosperity is a luxury that indeed the U.S. can afford. When faced with the prospect of default, a step too far, no longer a luxury, both parties in my country found a way to prevent tragedy. As a country, we've gone up to the line of putting politics before prosperity, but we've never crossed it.